evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome you all to the next edition of our guest speaker series. Uh, it's actually our final one for 2023, so another successful season in the books, but we've got plenty in store for next year. Already got quite a few lined up, so we're happy. But tonight we have Stephen Huff with us, another local writer. He's local connections here. Uh, and he just uh, had a book published, Resting Among Us, uh, the author's grave sites of upstate New York, uh, which even features a, a local one I, I hear. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Stephen, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, as he said, I, I do have a connection with Tavia. I graduated from Alexander School but I lived in Batavia for a little while. I used to work on the Batavia Daily uh, News and, uh, when they were on Jackson Street. I worked in the, on, the, on the press itself. Um, <clears throat> it was a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know where they are now. They're, uh, are they even published in Batavia now? Are they? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. okay. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a uh, um, slideshow that I made for, for uh, following basically what, what my book covers. Um, it's, um, let's see, this is supposed to, uh, 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 uh. it's like, okay. As soon as I figure this out, I'll just... Is it? <laughs> it's an Sometimes there's an odd button on the clicker. There might be an odd button on the side. Oh. Oh. It's off. Okay. There you go. There we go. All right. The uh, purpose of my book is to acquaint <coughs> upstate New Yorkers with our literary heritage. Uh, the... the what, what's, uh, I, Not just in literature, but in the arts. I, I've noticed for a long time that uh, people <coughs> often have the idea that if something didn't happen in New York City, well, it couldn't have been very important. But we actually have a very, very rich uh, literary history in, in New York. Uh, I intentionally left out New York City. Uh, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, well, what, where is Washington Irving? Why isn't he in the book? Well, Washington Irving is buried in Westchester County. Uh, West, Westchester County would be another whole book. Uh, I was down, when I was researching this book, I was down in Dutchess County, and I found the graves of, um, of Norman Vincent Peale, uh, and, um, um, and, and I, the, um, I was telling the cemetery guy there what the title of my book was going to be, and he said, Dude, this is downstate. So, I, so all right. So I, I turned tail and came back. Uh, uh, and this is my disclaimer: I'm not a historian by profession. I'm not a scholar by profession. I'm a writer in search of my tribal ancestors. Now, uh, most uh, a lot of people who are big readers and live in New York know that this fellow is buried in Elmira, New York. And this fellow, James Fenimore Cooper, is buried in Cooperstown. Uh, his whole family was buried there. Uh, his, father, his father was a founder of the town, actually. Um, but who is this person? And who is this person? Who's this, who's this woman? And who's this guy? Well, um, I think what I'm going to do is start with Batavia and then kind of go out in concentric circles. And I, there's so much ground to cover, I can't cover, I can't cover um, the whole state. But I can start with, uh, with this man, John Gardner. Uh, John Gardner grew up in, he went to Alexander School too, but he did his uh, senior year in Batavia. There were courses that he wanted to take and uh, so he transferred to Batavia. Uh, his father was a uh, was uh, on the um, uh, on the uh, board, the, uh, the board of education in Alexander. Uh, I was uh, I was with a group of people who were um, breakfast partners with his parents, 
We used to go out to breakfast a lot, and they liked to talk about John. And one day, uh, you know, John was very famous for his uh, for his long white hair. This is a, a, a novel that set in Batavia. I don't know how many or if any of you have read it. The Sunlight Dialogues. It's a, it's a, I think it's a great it's it's a great psychological novel. Um, the Sunlight Man is a wild man that uh, that. Um, uh, that the novel is built around. There are a lot of people in this novel who, if you've lived in Batavia for a long time, you might recognize them. Uh, sometimes he didn't bother to change their names. Like Dr. T.M. Steele is in the novel. He was, um, he was a real doctor uh, <clears throat> and practiced here, I think, at least up into the 70s. I don't think I ever met him. I never met John himself either, but I knew his parents quite well. Um, this is his grave in Grandview Terrace. Uh, it's easy to find if you go in the um, if you go in the entrance. It's kind of a circular entrance. If you go in the, the one that's closest to downtown, and and just park and just walk back. There are only a couple rows back. And now that's his uh, that's his father and mother, John Champlin uh, and Priscilla Jones. Uh, his parents, also buried there, uh, is his brother Gilbert. Yeah, that was a tragic story. When John was about 12 years old, he was driving a tractor with a, pulling a cul-de-packer, and Gilbert, his younger brother, was riding on the cul-de-packer and <clears throat> fell off and was driven over, and, and John killed his younger brother. He was buried there. Uh, that that um, was the big tragedy. John Gardner's life and their family, really. But he, uh, there's, um, uh, I think it informs a lot of his fiction, especially his, uh, the Resurrection uh, is a, a collection of stories, and the title story, Resurrection, covers that story. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, I wanted to say, um, if I'm moving too fast, let me know. I, and if you have any questions, jump in at any time that you like. This is Mary Jane Holmes. Uh, she was from Massachusetts originally, and she married a lawyer from Brockport and, and moved there. And after she got to Brockport, she began writing novels. She was a romance novelist, um, but she was also a very famous, and, and uh, she was one of the best-selling uh, she and, I think, Harriet Beecher Stowe were two of the best-selling women novelists of the 19th century. Uh, you can still get a lot of her books online um, as e-books. You can find them, uh, hard copies of them. And uh, she is, there's one of them. Uh, she, but, but uh, when you say romance novels, uh, it's not like the ones that we see today so much, you know, where this cover always shows a, a, a Victorian house with a light on in the tower or something like that. Uh, hers, uh, she, she took on some of the issues of the day. She took on um, issues of women's suffrage. She took on uh, abolition. She was a, an abolitionist by uh, politically. Uh, and so while they were, I, I guess you could say, um, Romance novels, they, 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 they did have a lot more depth to them than you would, than you would imagine one, a romance novel to have today. She's buried in High Street Cemetery uh, in Brockport. I lived about three blocks from there for years, and I never even knew the cemetery was there. It's, it's at the uh, west end of town, and it's, um, uh, and this is, um, this is her grave. This is her husband, and that's the, the uh, that's the, like the Celtic cross there that's, that marks the, the the family plot. This man uh, is uh, A. Poulin Jr. Uh, he was a mentor to me in, pub in the publishing business. He was a poet. Uh, he was a publisher. He started Bow Editions, which. Uh, which was, which still is one of the foremost literary small presses in the country. He started it in Brockport, and 
Uh, and this is, these are his selected poems that were published after his death. He died uh, in uh, 1996 at the age of um, 56. Uh, and uh, this is contemporary American poetry. He was also an anthologist. And this, uh, this, uh, this went through about seven or eight editions with Houghton Mifflin. It, and at one time, it was the most commonly used uh, textbook of contemporary American poetry in, in college classrooms in America. It may still be, but I don't, I don't think so because uh, Houghton Mifflin let it go to another press, and I don't think it's done so well since then. But, uh, this is his grave in um, Lakeview Cemetery. One of the things that I found I, in traveling the state, there are I, the most common name of the cemetery in New York State, as far as I can tell, is Lakeview Cemetery, <laughs> except that it, uh, in none of them could I see a lake. <laughs> <laughs> this one is about 10. 10 miles from, um, from Lake Ontario. So I think maybe they're talking about the big lake in the sky. Yes, sir. Oh, what town? Oh, I'm sorry, it's in Brockport. Oh. In the town of Sweden. So it's about, oh, my goodness, it's about two miles south of town uh, there. Yeah, thanks for asking that, because I can get off on a tangent here sometimes. This plate here was made by an artist named Robert Marx, who's also passed on now, but uh, he's a well-known painter and printmaker. Um, you can't read it very well. He, actually, if you're on site, you can't read it very well, and that's Al. He, uh, he, would have, um, he wanted something to look good more than actually... He, <laughs> I don't think he was very concerned about whether people could read it or not. He just wanted, to, he just wanted it to be artsy. He used to tell me I was visually illiterate. I didn't understand painting quite as he did. But. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this, this book is uh, resurrect the reputations of some writers who um, are not very well known anymore, even to people in the area where they, they work. This is Anthony Piccioni. He was a very fine poet. He wrote about six books of poetry. And uh, he, he taught at SUNY Brockport. Uh, he was kind of a, he was a Buddhist and he was kind of a shaman. Uh, people who knew him thought that he was more than a poet, more than a teacher. He was kind of a personal shaman. He helped them, help people uh, come to understand, you know, if the, the, old, the old prescription, know thyself, he knew, he, he, he would force that in a poetry class. You weren't just there to write poetry or read poetry. You were there to come to know yourself through that art form. Uh, this is one of his books, For the Kingdom. That's a Thomas Cole painting, by the way, hanging in the, um, um, in the uh, um, um, Memorial Art Gallery in Rochester. And I, I knew that wasn't going to project very well. I tried bumping up these photos with DPI, and they, they don't all bump. Here's his grave. It's in Kendall. He liked. He didn't like living in. He didn't like living in cities. He didn't even like living in towns. He he was always moved, trying to move out of town farther and farther. And um, this is his grave uh, in in Kendall. Uh, with his with, a, with his poem on it, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of the stars and falling outward. I've forgotten the title of that. I can't read it there. But there's the Buddha there in front. Part of his ashes are down there. Part of them have been spread elsewhere. I'm not sure where altogether. Uh, Anthony Piccioni, a big bear of a man. He was the kind of guy, if he walked into the room, all eyes went to him. He had a kind of charisma about him like that. This man was the most photographed American of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Uh, he, uh, he was born in slavery in Virginia. Uh, he escaped to the North. And he wrote a book, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, that's his 
first of three autobiographies that he wrote, uh, and de detailing the, his story, what life was like for him in the, in the plantation in the South, and, um, and his escape north. The, it, it was a big selling book at the time. Unfortunately, uh, it, uh, it meant that he had to get out of the country because in those days, uh, before the Civil War, before emancipation, uh, if you escaped north, a southern, a southern could, uh, a slave owner could send, send an agent north to capture you and bring you back your property. Um, so he had to escape to England, uh, where sympathetic Brits um, paid, paid for his freedom, raised the money, and, uh, and bought his freedom from the plantation owner in the South. And um, he wrote two more autobiographies, but as, as I said, this is his grave in Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester. Uh, he is there with a daughter and his first and second wife there. His first wife died. Then he married a white woman, uh, which was a big deal then, uh, especially in, in a, well, Rochester was a small town basically then. Um, but he wasn't about to be, he wasn't about to be uh, turned by such silly considerations. So, uh, so they're, they're all buried there. Uh, it's not that hard, you know, in, in uh, Mount Hope Cemetery, which is a real microcosm of, 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 um, of history there, uh, there, are easy, there are signs, it's easy to find his grave and it's easy to find Susan B. Anthony's grave. Well, I don't think most people think of Susan B. Anthony as a writer, however, she and Matilda Jocelyn Gage and Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, did uh, write and edit the books that are the four volumes of um, the history of women's suffrage. So she was a writer, and that's why she's in this collection. Um, this is her grave on election day in 2016. Uh, you can see a lot of some people have, uh, have put the stickers on, I voted today there, and decorated the grave. The, um, in fact, actually, a few days earlier, it was just plastered with, with those stickers and, and I think the cemetery keepers had to, had to come and take them off and then told people not to, not to put any more of them on there. But uh, that's it. Well, the, uh, uh, most, of the, most of the graves of authors uh, I've found, with only a few exceptions, um, are very humble. Uh, very spare, very humble, not elaborate, elaborate monuments or, or um, this woman is Lillian Wall. <clears throat> she has a very interesting history. She, uh, she was born, I think, in Cincinnati, but she grew up in Rochester of uh, Jewish parents. Her sister became a nurse, and that was her first big aha moment. She decided she wanted to be a nurse as well. Uh, and she went to nursing school in New York City at, uh, at, a, at a teaching hospital in, in Manhattan. And uh, on graduation day, a boy came running into the school and, and told her and her friend that was also a graduating nurse, my mother is bleeding, I need help. So, she, so they followed this kid. They followed him into a dark, smoky tenement house up about six floors and found the woman who indeed was hemorrhaging. Uh, and they saved her life. Uh, her book is The House on Henry Street. It takes some guts to read it because there's a lot of stories like that. But she, um, she stayed in New York and she, she started, the, um, started a, a a settlement house called the Henry Street Settlement House, and it was where uh, poor people could come for medical, uh, for medical aid. They they could come there to eat. There was food. Uh, there was shelter when they needed it. Uh, she did a lot more things. She she uh, pushed the city to to uh, establish playgrounds in Manhattan that didn't exist yet, uh, and she. Uh, she hid people who were, who were in trouble. She, uh, the the uh, um, uh, Bolshevik revolutionaries from Russia that were in, 
had, had escaped to New York. She hid them out so that they wouldn't be assassinated. Uh, she became, she, she was a, a friend, people really respected her. Uh, and Mayor, La, Mayor LaGuardia was a good friend of hers. And, and people would visit, people, both Roosevelt presidents, Theodore and Franklin, both visited the Henry Street Settlement House. Albert Einstein visited her. Uh, and, um, and that place, the, the Henry Street Settlement House, is still in business. They have a website, you can go out and see what they're doing. They have a lot of stuff going on there, activities for, for people, and, and medical care still. Uh, and she, uh, she lived until 1940. This is her grave in Mount Hope Cemetery. They brought her home when she died. Um, March 1867 to September 1940. And those are, some of those are real flowers, some of them are, are, are not. But there are people who uh, maintain and, and, and look after her grave and make sure that it's, that it's always clean and always flowered. <laughs> She's buried next to her sister, by the way. Slaughterhouse Five. How many of you have read Slaughterhouse Five by 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 John by by, uh, by Kurt Vonnegut? Well, Kurt Vonnegut, the hero of Kurt Vonnegut's novel, is Billy Pilgrim, and Bill. This is the one person in the book who is not a writer. His name was Edward Crowley. And, and he, was, uh, he was a prisoner of war in Dresden along with Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, in, in 1945, there was the, that big uh, firebombing of Dresden, and which, which just leveled the city. They were underground at the time, uh, and, and they, didn't, they, they, were, they survived it. Edward Crone um, died of starvation. Apparently, some people said he died of a broken heart, but he was giving his food away to kids, his rations away, and and he died. Um, when uh, there used to be a, a lecture series uh, in Rochester called the Arts and Lecture Series, and one and one time they brought in um, Kurt Vonnegut, and I talked to Rosemary Man and Cuso, who's one of the one of the people that um, that ran that series, and she said that she and her, her uh, Susan Feinstein that she worked with uh, told Kurt Vonnegut, you know, the Billy Pilgrim is buried here in Rochester, and he said, oh no, he said I I I, I helped bury him. We, there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't anything to bury him in. We made a cloth suit. Uh, we made a suit for him on a paper, we buried him. And they said no, his family had him disinterred and brought to Rochester and reburied. And he, they brought him to the cemetery and they waited for him at the gate. And he went in and sat with Billy Pilgrim for a while and had a few cigarettes and came back to the car and he said, now that, now World War II is closed for me finally. That's, that's Edward Crone, Jr. I, you know, I, I've never been able to find a, a picture. Uh, I had a couple of pictures. When this, whole thing was just a blog. I had what I thought was a picture of him, and then somebody told me, no, that wasn't him. Uh, but I've never really had a, a real picture of him. So it exists somewhere. He went to, he went to um, Brighton High School. This, I told you who this, I told you I'd tell you who this person is. This is Adelaide Crapsey. She was a, she was a poet, and she um, only published one book. Uh, but it's, but it's still an important book. Uh, it's, uh, she invented, she was the only American, I've been told, I've read, who actually invented a poetic form called the Sinke. It's a five-line poem. It's a five-line poem uh, based on the haiku and the tanka forms. It's called the Sinke, and, uh, and she was way ahead of her time. She, uh, she uh, she used line breaks for instead of commas and places, like which which the modernists that came later were, were doing some of them, and, and and poets are still doing. She's the earliest case I've ever seen of anybody using that that technique in a poem. Uh, she died of tuberculosis in 1914. 
she uh, had graduated from Vassar College and uh, never actually only published about one poem in her in her lifetime. But she, um, but she um, had followed. I, I, I need to also tell you about her because here's her grave. Uh, yeah, that's her grave there in Mount Hope Cemetery. And this is the grave of her mother and father. Her father was an Episcopalian priest. And he went off the reservation, you might say, in his sermons. He, he preached that, um, that, the, um, that the, um, uh, the nativity and the miracles were, were myth and that what people should be just following the teaching of Jesus and not believing in the, in the, in the miracles. And he was tried for heresy. That's what they did call it. They called it heresy. And, he, and the, the uh, diocese was, in, was uh, based in Batavia at the time. And so they held his trial in Batavia. The church was big enough, so they moved it to the courthouse. And, and he was found guilty of heresy and defrocked. And so um, he wrote a book called The Last Heretic, which was his version of events, of course. Uh, but it was big news, it was, it was national news. And in fact, it was news in Europe that this man was being tried for heresy. <laughs> Except that they didn't, we didn't put people in jail for heresy, we just defrocked them in those days. Uh, there was there's some thought that, that, that uh, she was so upset by his defrocking that, uh, that, that it hastened her death, and I don't think that that's actually true. Her, that happened in 1906. Her tuberculosis showed up a few years later. In fact, after she graduated from Vassar, uh, it seemed to have gone away, and she thought that maybe it had been misdiagnosed, so she took a job teaching at Smith College. And, um, but then it came back with a vengeance, and she, she passed away. Um, this is the mausoleum of Lewis Henry Morgan. Lewis Henry Morgan. Am I moving too fast? No? Okay. Lewis Henry Morgan. This is also in Mount Home Cemetery in, in Rochester. Lewis Henry Morgan was a railroad lawyer, and he got interested in the Seneca Indians in the, in the Iroquois, uh, Five Nations. And he, he, he began studying them. And some people call him the first uh, anthropologist. He, he did a very deep study. He wrote several books on, on, um, on, on Seneca <coughs> Indians. And uh, he investigated their family structures. He found out that they and other Indian tribes were matrilineal. And, and uh, his books about, about the family systems and the commonality of ownership and, and land actually influenced Marx and Engels, believe it or not. Um, that's his mausoleum. It's gotten into disrepair, but I've, I've been told that, that there's, there are groups trying to restore it and make it, not, you know, uh, spruce it up a bit, which is a good thing. Uh, it's, I think, the largest mausoleum in the, in the, in the cemetery. This is um, a movie star. This is Louise Brooks. Louise Brooks uh, was, uh, she did make some films in the talking era, but she was, um, she was best known as a silent film star, one of the first flappers with the, with the helmet hair. And um, she made probably her most famous uh, movies uh, in Germany with, with G.B. Pabst, the um, Pandora's Box and others. Uh, but she uh, became very disenchanted with Hollywood. And she made her, I think she made a film maybe as late as 1936, which was an early John Wayne vehicle, I think. And she, um, she just dropped out and she moved to Rochester because uh, the uh, film curator at the George Eastman Museum, James Card, located her in, in New York City, found that she was living in a little apartment and, and writing scholarly articles on Hollywood and, and filmmaking. And he brought her to Rochester, set her up in an apartment 
uh, on Goodman Street, and that's where she lived until she died in 1985. Um, her book, that she, it's the only book that she wrote, is um, Lulu in Hollywood. You can't see the word Hollywood there very well. It's, it's, uh, it's still regarded as one of the best books about the silent uh, film area in the United States. Uh, she she went to the parties at the, at her expansion. She went. She knew everybody, uh, and she had a terrible, uh, terrible attitude about Hollywood. Somebody asked her why she why she quit Hollywood, and she said, "I've got seven hundred reasons, all of them good." <laughs> <laughs> She's from Kansas, by the way. Yeah. That's her grave. People still love her. I love her. There, there's people have. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a cinephile. Uh, there's people still leave roses there. Sometimes I've seen her, her portraits of her in little class, plastic things left there. A lot of people leave mementos there for her. Uh, and that's in, that is in the cemetery, the Catholic cemetery, what's it called? Holy Sepulchre. Holy Sepulchre, yes, that's up there. She's there. Easy to find. I've been there several times. And, oh wow, Henry Kloon. Um, Bill, you knew Henry Kloon. Yes, yes. <coughs> he was a, a newspaper man uh, for the Gannett chain, and he wrote uh, a number of novels, and he lived to a Methuselah age of 105. He was in great shape until the end, had a martini every day at 5 o'clock. <laughs> and he's actually a, a He's a friend of Louise Brooks's. I was, I was going to, <clears throat> the Louise was kind of a poison pen type, and he had these great uh, Christmas cards from Louise. And I remember one of the Christmas cards, the first line out was, I've always hated you. <laughs> Didn't she call him bourgeois or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, goddamn bourgeois. Actually, his son, uh, Henry's son used to, uh, he, Henry would always send things over to Louise. And he said he never wanted to go because she would just use a motor mouth. She'd never stop talking. So she would send his son. And I told that story to <coughs> Louise Brooks fanciers, and they're like, oh my god. Yes. It, 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 um, it's, he's buried next to his wife, Charlotte. And that's on Swamp, the, the, the cemetery on Swamp Road, uh, as you leave Rochester going toward Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit harder to find because they're almost all flat stones, like, like his. Um, they're like that. So it's, so it's hard to find landmarks in the cemetery, but uh, in my book, I, I've got instructions. You can find it if you want. Um, his wife was an Olympic swimmer, Charlotte. And her father, her father was a, was a Canadian adventurer who was a Yukon speculator, and, uh, and he went to Russia and helped the Bolsheviks get their trains running on time. He was, was, an incredible guy, but of, of the bunch of them, I think Henry is the most interesting. He, his novel, uh, by his own hand, was it was a kind of a veiled um, novel about George Eastman. He said it wasn't. But Arch Merrill was another um, newspaper man from Rochester, the Democrat and Chronicle. He was a <clears throat> he he loved upstate. He sometimes called it. Poet laureate of upstate didn't write poetry, but he wrote these uh, quick, thin little books about New York State history. Uh, one, his first one actually is called River Ramble, where he went all the way down to across the border into Pennsylvania at the mouth at the at the source rather of the Genesee River and walked it all the way up to um, the water. He accepted a few rides, but. Uh, he, which was pretty good for a, a guy almost 50 smoking cigars and <laughs> walking in street shoes. <laughs> he was a character. He was a, a real character. Uh, that's, this cemetery is, in, um, is called Brighton Cemetery. It's actually in Rochester. And it's near the East Avenue Wegmans, a little short street. And it used to be called the Dutch Cemetery because Almost everybody in the cemetery uh, before a certain date were Dutch, and there was a Dutch Reformed church there originally, which is gone now. 
And it used to be right on the edge of the Erie Canal, which the Erie Canal isn't there now. We're quite there in the same place now. But that's him, Arch Merrill. That's his daughter and his wife. His wife accompanied, accompanied him on his travels around upstate New York. And you'll still find people who, who have, have all his books. There's about 20 of them. And uh, people who read them every year. Uh, they're, they're quick reads, but they're engrossing. Arch Merrill. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The reason I'm going to jump ahead is because this man, I'm, where I'm going right now, I'm jumping way out of the area to Pulaski, New York. I know I'm not pronouncing the name of the town right But this is, this, <coughs> this is um, Claude Bragdon. Claude Bragdon was a um, Rochester architect. That was his main, main thing in Rochester. He was an architect, but he was a mystic. He was a mystic, and his most, um, his best known books is, well, that's More Lives Than One, I believed in reincarnation too. He, um, he, uh, his most famous book, I think, is uh, The Beautiful Necessity. It's a mystical approach to architecture. And uh, he started a, a publishing company called Mana, um, Mana Press, you know, Mana is the Hebrew, um, you know, the gift from heaven. Uh, and he was the first, pu he was the publisher of, of uh, Ospensky's second book, the, the, the mystical guy. And uh, he was a friend of, um, friend of a lot of people like, um, in, in, that, in that world. And he, his second wife was a spiritualist. The first wife died. His second wife was a spiritualist. And they were friends of the uh, Crapsies, Algernon and Adelaide. And, um, and in fact, he traveled to Batavia with Adelaide to her, to the, uh, to her father's, father's trial, the, the train, train from Rochester to Batavia and back. And after Adelaide died, his wife uh, said that Adelaide came to me in a dream and said that I have, a, I have, a, I have poems that, that are unpublished. And so, um, and so Claude Bragdon goes to the um, goes to the Crapsey's house and says, uh, tells about the dream, and they said, yes, she has she has a pile of, pile of poems here, and they they published them, and uh, they became very influential poems. But he was the one who who actually published them. Now, whether she actually came to his wife in a dream, I, <laughs> I'm not going to make any claims, <laughs> although I'd like to. But. More lies than one. He believed in reincarnation. He was a theosophist. As a, uh, <clears throat> we're going to see, we're going to see another theos theosophist here pretty soon. This is where he's buried in uh, Pulaski in the cemetery. That's that's a sister next to him, I think. And um, you know, here's an architect, and his, his stone is like a leaning tower piece of here. <laughs> now, anybody know who this guy is? Anybody other than Bill know who this guy? Is? This is Fran Stryker. He was the creator of the Lone Ranger in Pano. He, <coughs> he, he, he started writing scripts uh, at a station that he worked at in Buffalo, and, um, and they started doing, doing Lone Ranger on the radio in Buffalo. He moved to Detroit, I think it was WXYZ, and um, the, the station manager there, pressured him, gave him a little better job, and pressured him to turn over uh, rights to the Lone Ranger. Was it George Trogdon? I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, I often wondered why he turned the rights to that over so quickly, but then I realized this was the height of the Depression. He had a family. He's probably trying to support. So, he, but, but he also, wrote uh, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon uh, and, and uh, the Green Hornet, he did. And he lived in Arcade uh, the last years of his life. And um, you know where Arcade is, it's in Wyoming County. And, 
And uh, he had a barn, there, there was there's a couple of barns there. One was a long chicken barn, and he had a, an office at the far end. There weren't any chickens in there. He had um, a, a, a little desk and stuff at the far end. And it's interesting, it always interested me that he could sit there and, you know, with a pack of cigarettes and a, and a thermos of coffee and pound out, um, you know, television scripts and, and um, radio scripts and books, just one after another. Uh, it was not great literature, but he was, but he was obviously having a good time. And he was going to move his family to Eden, New York, and he had just draw, draw, driven to Eden, New York, when he got into a car accident, and he was killed. 1962, I think. He was about 57 or 8. So probably very shortly after that picture was taken. Um, Oh, Ranger. Only from Audible. This is his grave in Arcade Rural Cemetery. It's not actually very rural. It's right on the edge of the edge of, edge of the village, and uh, all his family have these um, these silver silver crosses as markers. Uh, the um, you know, they're not silver bullets, but they're silver <laughs> crosses. Anyway, um, the uh, you go if you when you enter the cemetery. It was hard for me to actually find it when you when you go into the cemetery. There, <clears throat> there's a, you just go all the way up to the top of the hill, and 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 you'll see those crosses there. Uh, there are local people there that really don't didn't, couldn't help me find them. I had to. I had to do it myself. Oh, by the way, uh, Tano uh, was played on TV. It was played by an by, uh, 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 Iroquois named Jay Silverheels. And he was from that reservation that spans the um, northern border of New York into Canada. He was from that reservation. He played on uh, lacrosse teams in, I believe, Syracuse, Rochester, Akron, New York, and Buffalo. Uh, he, the reason he was playing on, on a lacrosse team in, in Akron is because of the reservation, I don't want a reservation there. And um, lacrosse is very popular with uh, Puritoy. And, um, and then he went and played um, lacrosse out in California, and that's how he got discovered. Okay, 22 years a slave and 40 years a free man. How are we doing the time here? Am I running out of time? Okay, uh, 20, 22 years a slave and 40 years a free man. Um, Austin Stewart, he was also born in slavery. And um, only in his case, uh, his, uh, the owner of the plantation, he had a lot of slaves, and, but he had a bad gambling habit and he lost his plantation. So what did he do? He just, uh, he just told his uh, slaves, we're going north. This was uh, maybe like 1810, and the, and the uh, slaves were terrified. I mean, we're going up to Indian country. Well, they all made this trek, maybe 15 miles a day, and they got all the way up into New York to like Sodus Bay, and then things started falling apart. Uh, the slaves just went off, and, Every direction. You know, a lot of times we think about slavery being a southern thing. Well, <laughs> slavery wasn't illegal in New York until 1827, and not until the census of 1840 was, was, was the first census in which there was not a, a slave listed in New York State. Uh, this was his book. He was also a very formal writer. His, his prose is much more formal. Than, than Frederick Douglass, who was also very formal, but but he um, he talks about coming to New York State, uh, how he managed to get himself free. Uh, he found a legal way to get himself free, and he started a store in Rochester, uh, uh, a kind of a grocery store on West Main Street, and um, he wrote this book, which was originally published in Rochester, and he's buried in Canandaigua with his wife and um, three of his three, three of their children. Um, very interesting guy. 
You know this guy? Rod Serling? Rod Serling? He's, he's buried in Inner Lakin, um, in um, the cemetery, um, which is a little north of Ithaca. Uh, his family had a summer home there. And, um, and if you watch the old uh, Twilight Zone episodes on TV, you'll see Cayuga uh, Productions because they, their summer home was on Cayuga Lake. And um, this, this uh, I've been to a cemetery and visited to his grave several times, and, and there's always mementos. There are people, somebody left him a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> it was, and that's what killed him, you know. And it, it was, he died, he died in Rochester, by the way, in Strong Hospital. Uh, he, uh, after a series of heart attacks, he went in for open heart surgery in 1975. That was, that was a scary operation then. Now it's almost routine, but he died in, in recovery. Um, <clears throat> one day I found, I found a rock there. Uh, he has two daughters, and I found a rock there with a note on it saying, hi, Dad. Yeah. This is the guy that, for me, started it all. Um, the, um, somebody, uh, a poet, Robert Darling at Cuckoo College, told me that Paul Bowles is buried in the Finger Lakes. And Paul Bowles um, wrote, the, well, it's most famous for The Sheltering Sky. You may have seen the movie. Uh, and I couldn't understand how he could be buried in um, the Finger Lakes. He spent almost his entire life in Tangier. So I started investigating found that his grandparents had had a summer home in Glenora, and, uh, and uh, he spent his summers there. So he was a New Yorker, he was an upstater, uh, at least in the summer. And, that, and, and investigating that made me realize that uh, there must be a lot more stories like that. And there are, there's, 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 there's his grave in Lake, in Lake Mont Cemetery. Um, maybe I'll move a little quicker now. I think we're running out of, almost running out of time. I want you to be able to ask questions. This is Charles Jackson from um, Newark. Uh, he, he wrote this novel, The Lost Weekend, about an alcoholic. It was, it was semi-autobiographical. Uh, he's buried here in, uh, in the cemetery in Newark, New York. Uh, it was a, it's a very famous novel, and it became a very famous movie. Um, that's his sister and brother next to him. They were both killed in a train accident, where trains hit their car at the crossing, and they were both killed. Uh, and they shared a they shared a, 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 a casket together. And when they were laid out, uh, the, the the sister was lying on her side, and her brother was lying with his his head on her arm, as though they were just taking a nap together. It's kind of heartbreaking. Uh, anyway, uh, questions? Yes? Uh, where are you going to be buried? Do you know? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Wherever Betsy... Next to Betsy. Next to Betsy. Yeah. 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 I'm, I don't want to... I'm, I'm trying to stay out of this book. <laughs> Any other questions? How long did it take you to, to do the book? Oh, then, well, I started research. Betsy and I went and found Paul Bowles' grave in, 19, in, in, in uh, 2015. And, um, and I was working on it for at least five or so years. And then it, it, was a block, it used to be a block. And, um, and I used to go around the libraries and show the blog and talk about it. But, uh, but really, off and on, working off and on, probably about five years. Mm -hmm. And then and then I ended, started making it into a book. Yeah. Yeah. This is, by the way, Sarah Hopkins Bradford. She was a, um, a, a young girl's author. Uh, she wrote young adult books for, for girls. And she was the first uh, a biographer of Harriet Tubman. And the way that came about, Harriet Tubman lived nearby in uh, Auburn. This is in Geneva. She's in Geneva. Um, and her house was about to be foreclosed on. And so a committee got together and asked her to write a biography, to interview Harriet Tubman and write a biography of her and, and, and try to sell enough copies to save her house, which she did. 
Anna did save her house. However, it's a horrible book. <laughs> I, mean, I, I hate to say that, but, but it, it really is an awful book. Uh, but it did what it was supposed to do. She was a much better, I think, as a young adult writer. Yeah. This is, this, this is uh, Fayetteville near Syracuse. This is Elizabeth, um, uh, this is Matilda Jocelyn Gage. She was one of the authors. She was part of the women's suffrage movement, and she um, she wrote um, she she would well, she she was one of the authors of the book that that uh, Susan B. Anthony was part author of to women's the history of women's suffrage. But she wrote this book called Woman, Church, and State, in which she claimed that uh, that the um, that Judeo-Christian religion supported the subversion of women, uh, and 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 um, she got marched out of the woman suffrage movement for writing that book. Uh, it, it raised a lot of a lot of fur. She was also a theosophist, and she was the mother-in-law of L. Frank Baum, who uh, who you know, was in Oz. There's some there's some discussion that her theosophy may have may have uh, influenced the uh, but I don't know. It's, it's maybe a little thin. That's her grave in Fayetteville Cemetery. More questions? Yes, sir. Could you explain what theosophy is? Theosophy is kind of a deist philosophy that uh, God is, um, it, a theosophist is, um, believes that the spirit of God is in everything, is in all life. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't believe in a, in a, um, a messiah, exactly, but, the, the, but uh, in fact, in fact um, Emerson is kind of a theosophist, if you read Emerson's essays. Uh, the Spirit of God is in, in all things, all living things, and, um, and, um, and, uh, and I think they believe that the, that the consciousness in the Spirit goes on um, after, after death. And becomes part of everything. Become part of everything after death. Um, there used to be a Theosophical Society in Rochester. It's gone. There's one in Buffalo now, but there's still a lot of Theosophists. But they don't tend to be joiners, um, so to speak. I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. And any writers that. Uh you wish you'd included, you didn't realize until after you'd finished the book that uh, you ought to have? Well, I have a friend, a poet, uh, M.J. Iupa, who passed after this the book was already in galleys. I wish I could have included her. Uh, I'm sort of expecting people to tell me who I missed. Uh, and I know I had to have missed any number of people, uh, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, do you know anybody I missed? <laughs> Yeah, there's a woman in Albion. Her last name was either Phipps or Phelps. I think you told me about her. Once. And I don't. Yeah. Annette, maybe. Yeah. There was um, Israel Emiot, a poet, and he used to be. He's um, kind of escaped the Holocaust and came to Rochester, and uh, he's in. Um, He's in a Jewish cemetery up in Greece, and I walked those rows up and down and up and down and up and down and couldn't find him, and I asked for help from the cemetery administration, but I didn't get any help, so I was really sorry to leave him out because he was a terrific poet. Uh, maybe, maybe if I do another edition, I'll, uh, I'll find him. Find him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I guess that's it for, for now. You're a great audience. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you again, Stephen, for that enlightening presentation, for sure. Uh, just a quick little PSA for those of you here. Uh, we have some upcoming events through the rest of the year. Uh, we have November's trivia uh, on Thursday at GoArt. It's on the Cuban Missile Crisis, if anybody wants to join us. Uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, then next week is the big one, the opening of Wonderland of Trees, which you're seeing the <laughs> very beginnings of here. 
Uh, so November 17th, Friday night from 6 to 8.30, you can come and check out all the trees. We'll have food from DNR Depot and music by the GSO. So uh, feel free to come on by and check all that out, plus our basket raffle and everything. Uh, but the trees will be up through the end of the year. Uh, and I know I said Stephen was the last guest speaker, but I forgot about one. Uh, on December 2nd, we have Rob Thompson coming to talk about kind of all of his books <laughs> and all of his research, uh, including The Linden Murders. So if anybody's not uh, gotten the full story in that, we definitely see you then. Uh, and we have another concert by the GSO, another holiday concert on December 8th. So that is what is upcoming, uh, but there is plenty more to come for next year. Uh, and Tyler would be remiss if I forgot to mention that tomorrow opens the first portion of our solar eclipse exhibit, 98 years since the sun went out. Uh, so please stop by and check that out. You can learn about exactly what we were doing 98 years the last time we had a complete solar eclipse in our area, 1925. So, But the exhibit will reopen in February larger and more impressive. So this is a little bit of a teaser for what is to come. So. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thank you, again, Stephen, for the presentation. Uh, we do have some of his books for sale on the table there if anybody's interested. Uh, other than that, have a wonderful evening.